Değerli katılımcılar, değerli dostlar, tüm sosyal medya platformları üzerinden bizi izleyen bilim dostu, değerli insanlar, hepinizi saygı ve sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Bugün yine harika bir konuşmamız, konuşmacımızla karşınızdayız. Bu vesileyle TÜBİTAK Temel Bilimler Araştırma Enstitüsü'ne hoş geldiniz. Seminerimize hoş geldiniz. Seminerimiz İngilizce olarak gerçekleştirilecektir. Bu nedenle ben de, ben de İngilizce devam etmek zorundayım. Dear Professor Seozikin Pan, dear participants, dear colleagues and friends, a very warm welcome to everyone. Welcome to the inspiring online seminar series of TÜBİTAK Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences, which will organize relying on the unifying feature of science for humanity that provides us with the power of shared ideas and understanding. It is now my pleasure to let you know that this evening we have another wonderful episode of our interdisciplinary seminar series, and I have a distinct pleasure and honor to introduce you our very special speaker, Professor Jiao King Pan from the University of California, Irvine. He's going to give a great talk entitled Probing the Local Charge Density and Phonon Dynamics by Electron Microscopy. Jiao King Pan is the Henry Samueli Endowed Chair in Engineering, Professor of Material Science and Engineering and Professor of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California, Irvine. In addition, he is inaugural director of the Irvine Material Research Institute and founding director of the Center for Complex and Active Materials. Previously, he was a professor and the Richard and Eleanor Towner Endowed Chair of Engineering and director of the Electron Microbeam Analysis Laboratory at the University of Michigan. He received his PhD from Saarland University in Germany in 1991. Professor Pan is an internationally recognized material scientist and electron microscopy expert due to his pioneering development and applications of novel transmission electron microscopy methods for probing the atomic scale structure, properties, and dynamic behaviors of materials. His work has led to the discoveries of new materials and novel functionalities. Professor Pan has received the National Science Foundation's Career Award and the China's NSF's Outstanding Young Investigator Award. He is an elected fellow of the American Ceramic Society American Physical Society, Microscopy Society of America, and the Material Research Society. He has published over 400 peer-reviewed scientific papers in high-impact journals such as Nature, Science, and Nature Materials. With this, I want to thank once again Professor Pan for joining us this evening from our point of view and morning from his point of view. Jia King, good morning, and you're welcome to begin your talk. Thank you, Professor Ali. Thank you for very kind invitation and a kind introduction. Um, it's really uh, my pleasure to accept this uh, invitation and have this opportunity to speak to a different audience. And I have not been able to visit um, Turkey so far, and uh, it's on my List, but now during this, due to the pandemic, uh, everything is delayed. So, um, so this uh, I give you all great, uh, warm regarding uh, greeting from California, and uh, I'm sorry to keep you working, listen to my talk in the evening time. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, you can see my presentation, right? Yes, it's okay. great. Okay. Um, so I got this invitation, Professor Ali, and then have you think about what to talk about. And then uh, I choose a topic to talk about uh, more focus on the 
application of a state of art electron microscopy uh, for material science. Uh, so the title is to probe the local charge and phonons of single defects by electron microscopy. Um, so I will start with the uh, introduction of electron microscopy. Uh, here's a just a very brief um, overview um, of uh, electron microscopy compared to light microscope. So we all know that the resolution limit of light microscope is due to the diffraction limit. Um, so Rayna uh, resolution limit, or sometimes it's called Rayna criteria, determine that the, the um, resolution of light microscope is about half of the wavelengths. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, let me choose the... Um, Pointer. Can you see my cursor actually? Yeah. So on um, so the light microscope, you have source, you have a, a series of lenses. Usually you have a most critical one is objective lens and then put samples in a, at least a lens. And then light will be scattered uh, um, by the sample and then you form uh, image. You can you just put um, a camera or, or eye, you can see the image of the sample. The transmission electron microscope, we call TM, is very similar. Just the source itself is electron gun a device that generates electron beam, and then will be focused and prepare the beam to be ready to image the sample. So then you put sample in the, this position, we call stage, to holding sample. Elect, incoming electron pass through the thin, thin TM specimen, and then will be imaged by a very strong objective lens. That's the most critical lens for TM. And then you have a, a put a camera or different kind of devices. And then you can detect electrons which has interact with the specimen. So this is a, a, a very simple uh, introduction about the uh, ray diagram of electron microscope. And different from light microscope, transmission electron microscope can be operated in different mode. Um, let me see, I think I can change the pen to pointer laser. Sorry, it doesn't, the pointer doesn't work. So on the left is the electron microscope operated in diffraction mode. And on the, in the middle is the electron microscope operated in diffraction mode. So many people know that the, in the light optical system, so the image uh, that after the objective lens, convex lens in the optical system, you have two different planes. One is a diffraction plane at the back focal plane of the lens. And then below that, there is an image plane where you can see the real space image of the object. So in TM, you can switch operation mode. On the same camera, you can record in either diffraction pattern or the real space image. So this is a two typical imaging mode for the transmission electron microscope. On the right side, right hand side, there's another operation mode of a TM. That is using electron. Electron is a focus to small point that we call probe. A probe will scan through the specimen and then, you know, it's electron beam is scanned through the, a, a, a, a, a focus to a point and then scan through the specimen and then pass, the electron will pass specimen and then be detected by using different kind of detector. This operation mode we call scanning transmission electron microscope, we call STEM. 
The STEM mode is very useful for chemical analysis and can also be used to form real space image because each point you get intensity and also phase that will cons consist of many different kinds of information. Nowadays, the scanning mode is more popular and also easy to learn. And also image interpretation is much more simple. Uh, so electron microscope was invented um, almost a year, hundred years ago. And uh, um, this diagram just show you uh, the history of the resolution development, advancement of microscope. The blue curve here, the dots, this is for the light microscope. The electron microscope start with the green uh, uh, data points. So we know that the first electron microscope was uh, invented in Germany by Roska and his uh, team. And then through about 50 years, there's a lot of improvement from the microscope which, which has about the micron resolution until to about uh, two Armstrong resolution through about 50 years. And then that resolution uh, Im improvement was always the target of uh, a big, big job for the uh, vendor and also the uh, developer of electron microscopy. So about uh, start about year 2000, there's a significant uh, progress in the correction of the lens system so that the operation of the lens can be corrected fairly. And then the resolution improved significantly uh, in the last decade, um, about two decades now. Um, so the resolution improvement is basically from two Armstrong to 0.5 Armstrong through uh, over about two decades. So those red data points are typically for the uh, milestone in the development of our operating character TM. The resolution nowadays typically reach to better than one Armstrong in many uh, instruments in the laboratories over the world. So here's a just example to show you the functionality and capability of the electron transmission electron microscope. On the left side is uh, on, on the left side is a picture of our JUL uh, called Guangdong. It's a 200, 300 kV um, uh, operation corrected TM and stem. This microscope is located at UC Irvine uh, in our laboratory. And the, on the right-hand side, you see different kind of image. Uh, there's a 2D materials, uh, is a graphene. And then in the middle here is uh, from uh, bismuth ferrite, which is the interesting ferroelectric material and showing you a small um, uh, topological defect. You can see polarization can be measured by using electron microscope. You can see the polarization is uh, pointing outwards in the middle. It's very weak um, topological defects. Um, right hand side, you see a few examples. I will not, not going to show the details. This just show the capability of the electron microscope today. Uh, on the uh, top right, there's an example in our early publication showing the uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, is a uh, cobalt platinum in of atmosphere in oxygen or CO, you can see the formation of the uh, surface layer during the chemical reaction. Uh, below that, this is a small movie show you the switching of ferroelectric domains, just like a ferroelectric memory device, how the state of the uh, memory device change between one and zero. So polarization up and down. And below that, this is uh, the hysteresis loop of the ferroelectric switching. You can see that from the in-situ video, you can extract the hysteresis loop in the, uh, uh, uh, where it is switched. Uh, in the middle here, this is uh, uh, another uh, experiment showing the uh, reaction of the nanoparticles. This is again, is a co shell particle, platinum core and platinum core, uh, platinum shell, uh, palladium core uh, in the liquid and an electrolyte. So the liquid is aging the particles, which is, has a defect very quickly, but those very uh, regular particles will be very stable. Uh, and then move to the left is an example to show you the, how 
advanced electron microscopy can be used to probe local charge of the uh, crystalline material. So this will be uh, explained in details in the uh, next uh, rest of the talk. This uh, is another kind of a, a microscope. It's a dedicated scanning transmission electron microscope we call a, a, a dedicated stem. It's produced by a small company, Nyon, but they have a very dedicated instrument. Uh, the middle shows the very nice um, 2D materials image, high resolution TM image. This is modidium disulfide and imaged at 30 kV. And the resolution at this uh, uh, is still better than what Armstrong can see that the image is crystal clear. On the right hand side, shows a silicon carpet uh, structure with a one stacking fault in the middle. You can see that electron beam passed through the thin foil of the sample consists of a stacking fault in the middle. And then you scan beam from left to the right. And then you can recording the electron energy loss spectroscopy. The energy loss is due to electron beam interact with local region. In this case is due to the scattering by phonon in this material. And then the energy loss uh, is, uh, is, is corresponding to the phonon energy itself. Therefore, you can use this technique to uh, get the um, dispersion curve uh, of the um, uh, silicon carpet containing a, a, a stacking force. You can see that stacking force make a big change of the, um, of the, spectrum, uh, the dispersion spectrum. So the phonon will be, uh, uh, have a new characteristic uh, at the defect. I will explain this in the later of the talk. This is just a few examples. All right, so first, I want to emphasize that the ferroelectric material is a one of very important material, which has a lot of application in the devices and also have a new development that potentially useful for low voltage memory devices in the future. So this is uh, just to show you that ferroelectric material is characterized by existence of spontaneous polarization. Uh, here, the polarity is left is a downward and on the right is upward. So here's this just uh, the free energy plot as a function of the polarity orientation. So basically between this up and down state, there is a barrier. So the system the ferroelectric material uh, need, uh, actual, uh, need an external driving force to pushing the polarity switch between two states. So as soon as it is switched and then it's still stable. So this is a, is a this characteristic is a, it make the uh, application for uh, memory devices. Uh, on the right hand hand side is is again is a, um, uh, a video clip show the switching of ferroelectric domains between positive and uh, negative uh, polarization states. Okay. All right, so there's a many, many uh, fundamental scientific, some scientific problems in ferroelectric material. So I'm not going to uh, focus on this in detail. Just, just name two interesting questions. So for ferroelectric material, it is very important to know the polarization orientation and how can we determine the polariz polarization orientation in the atomic scale or nano scale. So the direct, direct imaging is important. So only TM can provide information. And what is the dynamics of the uh, domain switching? So uh, when you apply electric field or apply force, and then how the domain switch and how domain will move and how that is a newly discovered polar, right? The polar states or polar uh, topological defects change. So those are very fundamental questions. Um, so I've been focused on this problem for a long time since my uh, uh, PhD thesis. I've been working on ferroelectric material. I think I was the first one to observe the ferroelectric domain wall dynamics, including the vortices, polar vortices. I think this is really the first observation. This was at 1986. Um, and then I also studied the dynamics of the vortices and the ferroelectric domains. This is a, a very old movie. I never published this. This is recorded in Sabuken when I was a PhD student. See, the vortices uh, is uh, moving when the temperature rises. So this is the heating state. You can see that 
the movie is not like today's digital uh, uh, CCD camera. This is, uh, uh, is uh, still use a uh, very simple devices, but you can see clearly how the uh, vortices are moving in the system when the uh, chemical potential is changed due to temperature. And about 20 um, years later, uh, so my student at Michigan, Chris Nelson, he uh, put a lot of effort, modify the, um, the uh, nanofactories uh, scanning uh, tip in the TEM, and then can do very dedicated uh, switching of the fire electric domains. Again, you have seen this uh, video for uh, several times. So this works very well. Um, so it takes a lot of time to develop the new techniques, improve the uh, uh, in-situ techniques, but in the end, we are able to study the dynamics of fire electric uh, domain switching. Uh, nowadays, it's quite uh, uh, commonly used in the community. Another question I raised is, how can we determine the polarization from local region in fire electric? Particularly, can we measure dipole moment of the fire electric material from unicell to unicell? If we can do this, and then we can discover many novel states, polar states in fire electric material. So the development, I think our, my group is also uh, first to uh, uh, uh, use the electron microscopy to measure local polarization. So very few the first work was done by uh, one of my early students at Michigan, Wei Tian. So we study a uh, uh, MBE growing bit barium partner on strontium tartanate substrate. This bismuth barium tartanate is heavily compressed strength due to the substrate. And then the, this uh, strength will enhance the polarization of the uh, bismuth barium tartanate. So by using, at that time, the TM is, has no operation character. The resolution is about 1.5 Armstrong. Uh, it's a JUR 4000. Um, Professor, um, uh, Alif may uh, uh, know this because this law that this microscope no longer exists. Um, so use uh, this uh, quite a high resolution image and then do a, a quantitative analysis. We determine position of different kinds of cation and anion. In this case is a barium, titanium and oxygen. So in this way, we can determine the relative displacement between cation and anion uh, sublates. Use this, we can uh, determine the polarization from each unicell. In other words, we measure dipole movement from unicell to unicell. So this method was developed in 2000 uh, to 2002, um, published in, um, actually in Wei Tian's in 2002. And then another student come and then Pierce Lawson, he develop, further developed this method and using operation character TM, this was a T microscope in Berkeley. We get image and then he do uh, all analysis and also develop the uh, uh, software to uh, automatically map the polarization in the fire electric. You can see that this is a, a very interesting uh, work and this technique has been not, not been used very uh, uh, broadly in many TM laboratory. Um, so you can see in many publications about fire use this technique. So this is uh, the first uh, observation on the atomic scale of the vortices or the closure domains in the fire electric system. So when the fire electric domain wall uh, ending at a boundary uh, interface with the substrate or free surface, there will be a local charge a uh, bound charge uh, were alternating across the domain wall. And this alternating uh, bound charge will generate internal uh, uh, field. This internal field is against the polarization direction. In other words, this internal field created at interface will try to destabilize the polarization state. Therefore, new a polarization state may be induced. So this is the first time to show the vortices in the fire electric system. After that, and, and a few other graduate students working on that, like Linza Lee, and he observe, observed many different kinds of topological states, in including vortices, anti-vortices, hedgehog domains, anti-hedgehog domains. And then we also work with a theoretical group and do the modeling and that have a 
very uh, interesting uh, uh, results come out. So this is just a slide show you how this polarization mapping with uh, atomic resolution uh, help the discovery of scientific phenomena in the material science. On the left is a so-called disconnect, disconnect, disconnect, disconnect, disconnect uh, in the uh, fire electric system uh, observed in the uh, super lattice of strontium tartanate, lead tartanate by Professor Xu Liang Ma uh, in a, a metal research uh, institute in China. Uh, so this is a, it's a, it, it's very similar to Chris Nelson's vortex domains, but in the superlative system. Later, Professor Ramish at the UC Berkeley uh, actually has uh, uh, um, my previous student, Chris Nelson, as postdoc and use the same technique and then to study the smaller uh, periodicity, strontium tartan, light tartan, the superlative, and using the mapping technique can see, uh, discover a very interesting Vortice anti vortice arrays in this superlative system. So, this is a very nice uh, application of the polarization mapping. But now I'm going to ask the question about uh, the technique. So, the measurement of polarization, uh, what I just described, is based on the position of cation and ion. This only de depends on the charged ions distribution uh, displacement. So polarization uh, usually consists of two uh, contributions. One is ionic displacement, another is electronic displacement. So the electron uh, uh, uh, uh, contribution cannot be ignored in many system. Um, but in the end, I can tell you in this approach, so-called displacive uh, ferroelectric material, uh, the main contribution uh, of uh, to the ferroelectric polarization is due to ionic displacement. But anyway, but let's consider. So if you have a, an electron cloud around a nuclei, and then when you apply electric field, and then we also induce electronic dipole moment. So the total dipole moment is due to uh, two dis, uh, uh, displacement. One is ionic, another is electronic. But how to detect electronic distribution uh, contribution is not uh, easy. It's especially when you want to have an atomic or sub armstrong resolution. So to detect the charge density in the crystalline material is not new. Uh, so the uh, X-ray method and converging beam electron diffraction uh, can all give you the electron charge density by fitting the uh, scattering um, called, uh, structure factor of the atoms. But this technique does not have a high special resolution. This is a, a sample average method. If you have an individual uh, defect or have a nanostructure with a very small size, or you want to know the charge, the charge density change at the interface head, in the hydro structure, this cannot be done by using te this technique. Um, the a very high special resolution technique uh, including the uh, inelastic scattering scanning probe. So that is a surface method. You cannot see the uh, bulk uh, samples, all right. So, but transmission electron microscope offer opportunity to uh, developing technique and uh, to solve the local charge distribution. Uh, this is a work um, done by uh, Kat Miller. Uh, the, this is an important uh, reference, uh, uh, uh, theoretical work. They just rethink about electron scattering in crystalline material. And then using quantum mechanics, you can relate the momentum change of the electron passed through the specimen scattered by crystalline material. So the scattering itself is interacting between incoming electron and local electric field, right? So that means electron scattered and then will uh, uh, carry a momentum change. That momentum change is I give you the information of local field. So this is the, the, the relationship. So if you can, the momentum change can be measured in the TM by, by look at diffraction pattern. So if you know the momentum change and then you know the local electric field, that means you can measure the local field in a crystalline sample by using the electron beam. So this on the step left shows how scanning transmission electron microscope work, but most 
equipment to nowadays are available for TM equipment, inco including many different kind of detectors. Uh, stamp detector, got bright field, dark field, annular dark field detector, and so on. But nowadays, the new technique is developed, the so-called pixelated detector. Pixelated detector, the detector itself is not just uh, collecting uh, a total number of electrons in that area, but it is uh, including million pixels, okay, uh, or a few hundred pixels. Each pixel itself will be read individually. That means you can record the whole diffraction pattern on the back fork plate for each scanning point. When the electron prop scans through the specimen, pass through each point, you get one diffraction pattern. That's two dimension. The scanning prop scans through the specimen in a line by line is also 2D. So that means 2D scanning. At each scanning point, you have 2D diffraction pattern. So total the data set is 4D, is a four times two times two times two. So that's why this is uh, called 4D scan, okay? We don't have 4D uh, image. Actually, it's just because a 2D scan plus 2D diffraction pattern, so called 2D scan. So these slides uh, is, show, is cartoon, shows how 4D scan work in the microscope. Uh, it's uh, uh, constructed, it's, it's built by uh, calling at the UC, uh, the Berkeley lab. So you can see that, you know, electron prop, uh, through the specimen, and then um, and, and scanning point by point. At each point, you form a diffraction pattern. It's, you can see the diffraction pattern changing when the scanning point is changing, okay? And then each uh, diffraction pattern um, will be recorded simultaneously. Now you can see that you, this will generate a huge data state set. Right, each scanning point will have a one diffraction pattern. If you have million pixels, and that means million pictures of the diffraction pattern. Uh, by analyzing the diffraction pattern, you can get many information, uh, including charge density and other things. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, 4D stack in general. My more focus on the physics. So this is a, a, a slide. On this slide, on the left hand side is uh, showing the data. This is so-called reconstructed annular dark field image. So each diffraction pattern will only count the total number of black chunks. And then you can plot this plot. This is a 2D uh, uh, image. This is a simple, like a hard app image, uh, annular dark field image, okay? So that tells you the crystalline structure. You have heavy atoms here. You have a slightly light element here, but very, a light element like oxygen is not visible. You know, here should have oxygen, here too, but it's not visible. But uh, this is a same image. Just instead of just a plot intensity for each scan, we have a whole diffraction pattern put in the same location. You can see each of these uh, data point is a diffraction pattern. And here is example, we just enlarge one of these, and then you can see this is a diffraction pattern. All right, by analyzing this diffraction pattern, we can get the electric field distribution in the uh, sample. So let's do a little bit more uh, detail analysis. So as I mentioned in the Miller's paper, uh, the theory, uh, the development uh, uh, help you to link the momentum chain to the local field. Now with that method, using our data, just you know, the data on the left hand side, just for one pixel, you can see that we can get the electric field distribution along one of the atoms in the strontium tartanate, which is a cubic uh, crystalline material. And then you can see the field is pointing away from uh, the core of atom, right? Okay, so uh, this is a, a show, this slide shows two examples. On the left is strontium tartanate. The structure is a model, it looks like this. And then this is a cubic, no anisotropy. Therefore, electric field has shows, also showed uh, uh, uh, uh, no anisotropy. On the right-hand side is a bismuth borate, which is also proskite, but is in comparison to uh, cubic proskite, it has a distortion. This distortion is a rhombohedral distortion. Uh, due to this distortion, there will uh, there is a spontaneous polarization along the one, one, one direction 
on the cube, a diagonal direction. So now you can see that the electrical field distribution now is no longer an isotropic, uh, no longer uh, uh, symmetric. So you can see this uh, polar exists very, very clearly, right? So now back to you know, fundamental physics, the Coulomb uh, uh, uh, law will tell you that if you know the field, electric field distribution, you can calculate charge density. So this is a simple relationship. So on the left is electric field measured from diffraction pattern. So experiment out of 10. And then you can use this data to derive the charge distribution of the system. All right, this is charge, that is field. With this, and then we can show you that in they compare these two material, two, two kinds of uh, cross sky material. Strontium tartanet on the left, and bismuth ferrite on the right. And then the charge density can be derived according to the field. The bottom is your strontium tartanet uh, charge density, very nice, you know, it's a, a symmetric crystal cubic. And then on the right hand side is ferroelectric material. Now you can see how the charge dispute uh, in this material with a, a sub armstrong resolution. So the, the red color is negative charge, that means electron distribution in the system. This will give you a lot of information about how atoms bonded to, with each other. You know, uh, this is, uh, and also this will ex help to explain origin of fire electricity in the crystalline material, okay. Um, so because this is a technical development, the technique proposed, uh, developed and they need some kind of uh, test whether or not this makes sense. So we work with, uh, collaborate with uh, Professor Lu Chien Wu in the physics department at UC Irvine. Uh, he's a DFT uh, expert. We know that DFT can be used to calculate electronic structure. It can give you the could uh, give you the map of the electron distribution around the uh, uh, uh, nuclei. So, so on the top is experimental data for strontium tartanet and bismuth ferrite. In the bottom, she was corresponding the DFT calculation of charge distribution in two different materials. You can see that strontium tartanet, uh, the, the calculated experiment matched very well. And bismuth ferrite, which is ferroelectric, still looks quite similar. But if you look at detail, you see a little bit discrepancy, right? So um, I asked the professor, oh, you know, which one you believe is, is, is, is the real charge distribution? He said he couldn't trust, trust DFT much, you know, if I have a polarity and so on. But this does indicate that the method itself is very uh, interesting. So it's, a, it's a, a can use to map the charge distribution in the, in the material. All right, you see the charge distribution. But that you may ask a further question, how can you determine the valence state of individual atoms uh, in the image, right? So to do this, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. So DFT people already use develop method by calculate charge distribution and they can calc you know, calculate the uh, valence state of the element in the system by using so-called bad charge analysis. So we'll just uh, use this uh, learn from DFT people Use the same method you did to identify the uh, boundary between two atoms and then calculate charge distribution and then you can determine the uh, valence value of uh, a, a, a each element and the how electron distribute. What this, with this method developed, charge density can be mapped and then we can determine the charge uh, distribution instead of just ionic displacement in the ferroelectric material. In other words, we can measure the dipole moment of ferroelectric material from unicell by unicell, which including both ionic and electronic distribution, that solved the problem that I raised from the beginning. So with this measurement, actually the, the measured value, which is very close to the experimentally determined uh, uh, uh, polarization in bismuth ferrite. All right, so use this technique, we, uh, we, uh, we can do the um, single crystal analysis and the perfect crystal model system, but the, the real important problem is local charge in the defects. A simple defect is the interface between two uh, uh, uh, uh, crystalline material. For, this is the example of strontium tartanate, uh, bismuth borite, 
growing on strontium titan substrate. It has a very sharp interface. This is an MBE growing film. Uh, you can see this uh, very nice hard depth image indicated a, a very nice uh, uh, high quality architectural growth. Um, the structure looks very uh, uh, almost perfect. And then Lux is a uh, uh, green, uh, and, and more, this is a pattern, this is a chart, electric field distribution across this head interface. And then the chart can also be calculated by using this uh, data for electric field. You can see that this is a, a, a, a there's a, some kind of a change. Just look at field. In the polarity, it looks very clear on the right hand side in bismuth fluoride, but the no polarity in strontium tartanet if you move away from this interface. And charge uh, is presented here, but just look at image, probably it don't see much difference, but it can do. Quantitative analysis, I just as I just mentioned, you can uh, determine the core of each element. You can also uh, calculate the uh, octahedral tilting in the system. So this is a slide show you that atom displacement, oxygen octahedral rotation uh, in this uh, two uh, frost sky material change uh, quite abruptly and also uh, constant phasing across interface. So it's a low delay, but the charge density change more slowly across interface. You can see that, so this is slower. So the, the, there's a dragging uh, uh, around interface. So that means the electronic charge, supposed to be electronic response is fast, but charge distribution is slow. This means that there is uh, charge build up at the interface that will induce new phenomena. Actually, we know that there is a two electron gas at the uh, fire electric insulated interface. And this detailed analysis of local charge indicate that at interface, you have excess negative charge. In other words, you have electron gas located at interface. So this is a further confirm the things. So this, um, uh, show you the method how to probe local charge in uh, nanostructures by electron microscopy. So I guess I have another 10 minutes. Okay. Yes, so, sure. Yes, okay. sure, please. Yeah, so now I, uh, I'll change gear and then move to another uh, uh, direction of electron microscopy. This is also, um, uh, a new uh, area for uh, scanning electron microscopy. So as I mentioned, we have another kind of a dedicated stem called nylon ultra stem. Uh, in this TM, the mo operation mode is, uh, is, you know, for the scanning is similar to the 4D stem, but then we have an EOS detector, which will uh, uh, allow you to determine how much energy electron beam lost by interacting with sample. And then this uh, energy loss will be uh, detected and then uh, as a spectrum. You can also scan the uh, probe across the uh, specimen and then you can get uh, the information about energy loss. The very important part of this uh, uh, technique is its a capability at a low energy loss region. So incoming electrons is about a few 10 kilo electron volts but electron energy loss is very small. Typically for core loss due to ionization and so on, it's about a few hundred to thousand electron volts. But phonon energy is very small. It's only a few 10 milli electron volts. But this is very challenging for electron microscopy. But last 20, uh, 10 years, the development is so amazing. And then which allow you to detect uh, by using monochromate yields and with a new spectrometer you can detect a change in energy by uh, just for few milli electron volts. This is about 100 times better than the conventional uh, stem instrument. So the electron scattering by crystalline material typically have a two uh, uh, process, two, two type. One is due to the electron, electron interact with sample through the potential. So this is, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, even electron beams do not touch the sample. The electromagnetic field will interact with the uh, sample if that sample has a dipole moment. 
right? This is typical. Another most common is so-called impact scattering. So electrons hit on a sample, uh, one atom, and then will be, you know, uh, scattered. Uh, this kind of scattering is, is a straightforward to understand the phonon. So phonon will be uh, scattered uh, electrons and then change uh, the electron uh, beam energy very, a little bit that can be detected. So just quick comparison. Uh, the, um, the EOS, electron energy loss spectroscopy uh, to detect um, phonon, uh, which has a very high special resolution because TM, you can focus a probe to nanometer or angstrom. Uh, but in other technique can detect even smaller energy change. In other words, energy resolution is better, but the special resolution is not good. So, so this is a technique we are focused um, to see the, uh, the local change uh, of the energy by scattering, by, uh, uh, by interacting with the phonon. This will sh show you a quick example. So this is a small particle of silicon carbon. It's a 3C structure, cubic silicon carbon, um, compared to a large uh, 3C silicon carbon bulk material. So you can detect the, you can see that when electron beam stay away from this uh, silicon carbide material, and then you can still get spectrum, okay? That means a low method. So for the material with uh, um, a dipole moment, and then you, you, you, you, you have a complication. So the interaction, impact interaction, and also the dipole interaction. But for small particle, you can get uh, information used transceiving mode and a way, uh, uh, the surface effect because the total surface of the sample is small. So then you can get information just from the uh, bulk material. So this is uh, just an explanation of how that works. So with this technique, we measure the uh, uh, phonon uh, spectrum from individual particles. And then we do analysis show that you have a, a three different kinds of a peaks. One is a from um, so-called uh, polariton, another uh, two are from uh, two different branch of the phonon, okay? So, so that is a one, a one phenomenon, but this technique can be used uh, for making devices. So when electron beam pass through the small particles and then the phonon characteristic can be measured. You have an absorption of the phonon uh, electron beam absorbed phonon or scattered by phonon. Scattering is stronger, therefore the, this, uh, scatter, uh, the, the loss is stronger. So if you fit this peak uh, uh, uh, and then find the, the maximum position, energy position, and then by heating the sample from room temperature to, in this case, we'll heat to 100, 1000 degree. And then you can plot the relationship between phonon energy and the temperature. And then you can use EOS method to measure local temperature of the devices by vibrational microscopy. So this was uh, uh, done by Xu Xu, uh, a postdoc in my group uh, recently. But more exciting is using this uh, uh, dedicated stem with a uh, uh, new spectrometer to EOS can allow you to measure the phonon characteristic, the phonon spectrum with a good energy resourcing, special resourcing, and momentum resourcing. So because we have a, you know, can just change the, uh, the angle, the scattering angle. This is what the angle resourcing is. In other words, is we can measure the moment, distinguish momentum of the uh, phonon. So this is a new technique uh, with development. I'm not gonna give the details. So electron energy, uh, electron uh, uh, scattering stem the resolution is depends on converging angle. When electron beam is converging strongly and then the probe size is small and they get, they get a high spectral resolution. However, when electron uh, beam is uh, strongly focused and then the, uh, on the diffraction pattern, you don't see this kind of uh, uh, disc, diffraction disc, this is central disc. They all enlarge and overlap with each other. That in other words, you will not be able to get angle resolution or momentum resolution. So to get a, a simultaneous 
a special and angle re resolution, you have to compromise and using the middle part of the uh, uh, middle part that you work with. But this usually the special resolution is poor. So we recently developed method and we can use in the TM, you can simultaneously get an effective uh, real space image and the uh, EO spectra, right? And with this, we can just focus the region first using the high converging angle, like 33 milli radius, this is a diffraction pattern. Red circle indicate 30, 33 milli radius. So if each disk okay. is not with that, and then you get uh, overlap, but you get a very high special resolution, can be half angstrom, right? But you, when, when you want to detect your spectrum, and then you use a smaller converging angle, a three milli radius, smaller converging angle is like a small circle on this uh, uh, uh, image. So this small circle is, uh, uh, is you, you can use uh, just select individual refraction spot. And then in this way, you will get a very high angle resolution. In other words, you can measure the phonon with a different, um, a different momentum uh, uh, position. Okay. So you can, you can, you can uh, measure the dispersion curve of phonon. So with this method, with taking uh, stacking, single stacking fault in, in silicon carbide, silicon carbide is a cubic. So now use that, this is an image of the silicon car uh, stacking fault in silicon carbide, okay? This, this is a single defect uh, appear dark in the real image. And then if uh, this is the, the yield spectrum uh, image from the same sample, uh, the color indicates the, uh, uh, the intensity, okay? And then uh, the x-axis is the energy loss, you know, different kind of uh, branch of the, uh, of the uh, funnel. And then this vertical is the uh, distance from the stacking fault, right? So it's corresponding to the image. Now you can, from this image, you can see that at the interface, there's a red shift of the TA uh, photo mode. And also you have a significant mode change in the LA. And then in T, uh, TO, uh, the optical photo, you can see that you also have uh, some change, but then, but in, in, induce a huge number of uh, uh, uh, mode near the uh, stacking fault. So to understand this, we need to get um, uh, some kind of uh, insight by using a simulation. So again, we work with a Professor Ru Chen Wu, and he's a DFT person, and then start to calculate the density of states uh, for, of phonon in the system uh, with a superstructure, including a stacking fault in silicon carbon. And then experimentally observed data and the theoretic calculates photon spectrum looks quite uh, uh, similar. So this is very encouraging. So that means method work very well. But what is the contribution of single stacking fault in the system to the phonon, right? So we calculate the local phonon density of states of all atoms in the stacking fault. Um, uh, this is indicated by the uh, blue, uh, a purple box along three orthogonal direction marked as X, Y, Z, as you do here. With a phonon diffusion curve entire structure calculated as this uh, gray dotted uh, uh, curves. This is uh, for bulk. And then we consider the uh, momentum exchange of electron beam. So it's a K zero is transmitted beam and K is a scattered wave vector. And then the volumes uh, momentum chain will have a Q perpendicular parallel to the incoming electron and perpendicular to the incoming electrons and so on. So due to vibrational EO scattering probability, the vibrational mode with eigenvectors along direction perpendicular to electron beam, that means that Y and Z directions is a predominant in the collective EO spectrum. So we can see a lot of enhanced photon mode in the energy range of 330 to, yeah, 30 to 40 milli electron volts. 
around, uh, uh, around X point uh, in the Y and J direction. You can see here and here, you know? So is, this is a significant uh, uh, enhanced mode. So this calculation also shows that the defect follow mode stems from the change of interatomic uh, constant and symmetry broken, symmetry broken at the interface, and also the Brunian zone faltering. So we observe um, more flattened here, you know, in the optical mode, more flattened optical like uh, bottom branch in the defect in the defect region. Uh, to here because the purple color and green color is from defect region, atoms from defect region, okay? So which re will reduce thermal conductivity, which expand the measurement uh, result from the bulk material in the literature. So furthermore, this combination uh, experiment and uh, theory uh, combination also, you know, indicate that there's a, uh, uh, uh, the, the new mode, uh, the motion, the new mode is due to the special motion near the um, defect. I'm gonna show you here, okay? You see atoms in the stacking force move much more severely in comparison to the bulk material. So this means that the bounding characteristic at defect is different. In this case, it's uh, a little weaker. That's why uh, moving with a larger uh, uh, amplitude, okay? So this is quite in, in, in, in encouraging. All right, so I want to summarize um, what I've been presented so far. Um, I show you that atomic resolution electron microscopy is very powerful, which can be operated in different mode uh, with a high resolution in situ or as a spectr uh, spectrometer. So it is a, uh, uh, Interest, is interest, uh, it can be powerful to solve atomic scale structure problems and also can measure the property of the single defect. The dynamic behavior of the material can be studied by in situ TM. Uh, local electronic properties and the phonon properties can be, uh, electronic property can be measured by 4D stem and the phonon can be probed by uh, a dedicated stem with a new spectrometer with a very high uh, energy resolution. So example shown here is silicon carbon single stacking board. And uh, for charge density maybe we, uh, as the extent model system, we use a pulse guide. And for in-situ TM, that wasn't my uh, focus, but I demonstrate one example using the ferroelectric switching. And other electronic property, including topological states, for example, ferroelectric material polar uh, defects is, is an interesting phenomenon. So it's still a hot topic for the uh, condensed matter physics and material science. So uh, before I finish, I just want to make, uh, um, uh, acknowledge a student, postdoc, and also our staff and who are working on uh, this kind of different project. And uh, Chris Diego developed a 4D stem with a one pay vow. He's now professor at the UC uh, uh, University of uh, uh, North Carolina. And uh, um, uh, Hui Xun continued this project. Chet and Xin Xu is developing the uh, momentum resolved use and for the uh, following uh, uh, uh, characterization. And thank you very much and for your attention and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for this very impressive and exciting talk. Please ask questions uh, using chat button. Tiazun, may I ask questions? Go ahead, yes. Uh, first question, let, let's say. So, uh, at the... 80s of last century, there was a beginning from that time, there was a high degree activity uh, in cosmology uh, of topological defects. Since uh, it is assumed uh, that at the phase transition, at the early universe, some topological defects like domain walls, vortices, cosmic strings are produced. So then there was all this analogy that in solid states physics due to the 
dislocation or declination, similar effects uh, are formed as well, but that was theoretical prediction. Today, I saw that you observe this uh, at your uh, group and your colleagues uh, experimentally. So, how do you uh, manage to, to form these topological defects? What are the mechanism in, in your case, and how do you manage uh, to form this by manipulating, of course, atomic scales by, I wonder, how do you manage this? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Um, okay, so maybe it's me to share the screen. Okay. Very interesting question. So th th this is a um, slide to some topological state. This is uh, the uh, um, vortices, anti-vortices, vortices, anti-vortices. Um, and previous next slide here is a vortex array. Um, and then how this first uh, just uh, uh, use a very simple is a vortex system. What polar vortices? This is controllable. So it's uh, formed due to the boundary condition between a strong human tartar and light tartar in this example, because uh, one is uh, insulated, another is fire electric. And then the boundary condition, uh, uh, actually, this slide is very helpful. This is uh, uh, Chris Nelson's work um, before he joined Berkeley. So this uh, boundary, the interface, between ferroelectric and the vacuum of between ferroelectric and the strong heat tile which is insulated, the bound charge changing periodically. So this uh, boundary condition imposes instability that force the polarization to change its direction. That's why I formed this uh, closure, a uh, flux closure domain, which is directly related to this observation, the strong heat tartanet. So uh, uh, the interface between strong human target and late target net, and this boundary condition determine uh, when the thickness of, of ferroelectric material is thin enough, the boundary, the, the, the, the electrical boundary condition and uh, stabilize these vortices. So this is the origin. And then for skimming, for example, uh, Ramesh published a recent paper about uh, uh, 10 months ago. Um, so the skimming is also observed in this super lattice, the same super lattice, strong heat tartan and light tartan, or even just trilayer, one single layer of light tartan sandwiched by strong heat tartan. Due to the boundary condition, so this, uh, the topological state will change from this kind of simple so, uh, vortices to a uh, skimming like. So the, the polarization will, will change. Uh, there's a, uh, we've got two sides, one is diverging, another is a converging. Um, so it's all due to the boundary condition. In my opinion, those kind of uh, topological states in solid state material can be modified by the boundary condition, mechanical boundary condi condition, or by local charge distribution, because the polars, the polarization is sensitive to the local charge distribution. If you have a, uh, uh, some kind of controlled impurity charge here, that may induce the new topological state. Thank you very much. Does it mean that one can uh, create a materials with controlled properties? For example, it is well known that topological defects has a spe uh, specific interactions with radiation. For example, specific materials with uh, control properties in, in context of interaction with the uh, radiation. Yeah, I, I think so. So if, if a material is uh, radiated by highly high energy uh, um, radiation, like uh, X-ray or even uh, like an ion beam implant, generate a lot of defects, most of defects are charged. This will induce many different kinds of states. So we have a look at that, uh, this kind of uh, things. But this also offer a new opportunity. You can engineering defect, engineering boundary condition to, to, to, to intentionally build 
the type of topological state that you want. So we have uh, another question from, from Chad, uh, uh, asked by Professor Adam Tekin. Thanks for this nice talk, uh, Professor Pan. Uh, you have a very good agreement uh, in the charge density of perovskites obtained from experiment and computations. Do you expect to have similar agreements on other crystalline systems such as metallic alloys? Very good question. So we currently focus on perovskite because if you look at my background, I've been focused on the oxide bioelectric perovskite for several decades in my academic career. Meanwhile, I also um, have a new NSF funded um, MERSAC, Material, Research, Sci Material Science Engineering Center. Uh, it's a new center uh, funded by NSF. In this center, we have uh, um, two IIG. One of IIG focuses on uh, high entropy materials, including both alloy and uh, uh, oxide. So we are working on the uh, green boundary problem. And we also try to uh, using 4D STEM and to, to, to, to study the property of green boundary in, uh, in the alloy. So I, we have some data, but we are still just starting working on that. I, I think it, it is, I cannot tell you it will have a perfect agreement as we see in the prospect, but it's very interesting to see how that uh, uh, looks like. And if there's a disagreement, we need to find the why and how, how to, to understand the phenomena. It's a very good question. Other questions, please. So if there are no questions, perhaps CLC, we can stop here. What do you think? Yeah, thank Please you. Please your thank final, you so final remarks. Please give your final remarks. Thank you. Oh, so I think this is a great opportunity for exchange. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a different experience through Zoom. So I hope that um, the pandemic will over soon and then we can recover to normal life and we can also see colleagues in person in the near future. And uh, I, you, you know, I give uh, information about my group and my institute. And if you come to US, you are very welcome to visit us and uh, just give me a heads up and then we will be happy to host you here. And also in the future when I go to Europe and then We'll be looking forward to seeing you, all of you, sometimes in different opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice talk and we will be happy to have you here with us after this coronavirus situation is finally resolved in the world. In our uh, seminars in face by face, uh, summer schools, winter schools, uh, what do, do you like? So anyway, we will be waiting for you in person here. Yeah, thank you. So um, stay health and, and, and the best wish uh, uh, to everyone. And thank you, the same from our side to you. Thank you.